You're listening to Experience Imagination, a themed entertainment design podcast presented by Falcons Creative Group. Every episode, we discuss a new topic with a panel of creative professionals. Hi, I'm Cecil McPurry, President and Chief Creative Officer of Falcons. Hi everyone, this is Audrey DeLong. If you're listening to this in March, happy Women's History Month. It's been a joy to see and hear all the inspiring stories shared through various forms of media about women who made a profound impact in the past or who are at it today, pushing society forward with their voices, their talents, their hearts, and their minds. One such individual who is near and dear to our own hearts at Falcons is Jane Goodall, who turns 89 on April 3rd, and she is still going strong. In celebration of Jane's birthday and really her entire extraordinary life, we wanted to take a look back at a podcast episode we ran in December of 2020 that focused on the award-winning Becoming Jane exhibition, which debuted at the National Geographic Museum in Washington, D.C. in late 2019. Throughout this episode, you'll learn what it takes to create a transformative guest experience that gives new meaning to the term immersive storytelling. Our guests were all equally fantastic and had so many amazing stories to share. I was joined by Catherine Keene, who at the time was Vice President of Public Experiences and Executive Director of the National Geographic Museum, Alan Parente, Vice President of Creative at National Geographic, Jason Ambler, President of Digital Media at Falcons, and Bill Wallauer, a wildlife cinematographer and scientific advisor for the Jane Goodall Institute. We also sprinkled in sound bites from Jane herself, which I find to be so invigorating. She just has a way with words that few others possess. And when she speaks, you not only want to listen, but you want to take action too. Before we transition to Catherine, Allen, and Jason, I want to leave you with one of my favorite Jane Goodall quotes. Every individual matters. Every individual has a role to play. Every individual makes a difference. Welcome, everybody. Happy to be here. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, great to be here. We wanted to jump into the first question here, which is how this exhibition came about. Catherine, can you tell us about that? Sure. Jane Goodall is a legend in the world. She is one of the great voices for the wildlife on our planet, and she is probably the most famous explorer at National Geographic. So we have for many years wanted to work with her on an exhibition project. And in 2020, she was ready to celebrate the 60th anniversary of her first steps in Gombe National Park, which was the beginning of her career. And so we thought it felt like a perfect time to finally realize that project. So I know there were a lot of goals, obviously, bringing somebody like Jane, who's so iconic, to life, basically, through this exhibition and giving visitors almost a a transportive experience, allowing them to walk in Jane's shoes. I know there were a lot of different goals for the exhibition. Alan, can you tell us what some of National Geographic's goals were? Our goal overall was really to introduce a new generation to an iconic figure and a personal hero. At its heart, we really want to tell a great story. We want people to understand uh, how Jane became Jane and all of the rich background, the rich experiences that she had that brought her to be the influential person that she is. So for us, if success looks like if people walk out of there having learned something and really feeling inspired to do something to better the world. That's right. It's not just Jane Goodall, the explorer, the one that lived with chimpanzees in Gombe. I mean, it's, it's almost like she's had three separate careers but everybody knows her for her chimpanzee work. So just to bring her whole entire career to life, which has spanned many decades now, um, I want to ask Jason specifically, what were the goals of Falcon's creative group for this exhibition? Alan and Catherine and the National Geographic Museum team very elegantly sculpted how each section of the experience would tell a different side of Jane's story. I think for us, what we wanted to do was capture a sense of placemaking, of being there, of understanding all the different variables and and the stakes that were involved with what she was doing and the time and the place that it had occurred in. So I think we wanted to try and capture that and put some context into that uh, as much as we could. I want to set the stage a little bit for our listeners about what this exhibition actually offers to get. So Alan, can can you walk us through when the visitor enters the exhibition? Is it a 
kind of a linear storytelling of Jane's life and work? Not really, actually. Um, whenever you're doing a, an exhibit that's biographical in nature, that's typically where, where you end up. But honestly, the storyline that we came up with and worked through with you guys at Falcons was really much more cinematic in scope, I think. We definitely were looking at it more along the lines. Jane is known for chimps and her work with chimps. So clearly we wanted to start there, right? Um, this is what people know. It brings them into the story. And we put together a really wonderful intro film with Falcons Creative that set the stage playful. The chimpanzees are featured, but Jane is introducing herself before we go back in time and really get deep into how Jane became Jane, how she was a very powerful and confident figure, even as a young child, and all the influences and learning that brought her to be able to travel you know, at a very young age in her early 20s, at a time when women didn't have those opportunities, to travel all the way to Africa and do this research that was completely new. I didn't set out to study chimpanzees. My childhood dream was to go to Africa, live with wild animals, and write books about them. <laughs> Most people laughed at me, but not my mother. She said, Jane, if you really want something, and you work hard, and take advantage of opportunities, and never give up, you will find a way. And I did. And then moving back into this linear next steps, when she realized that chimps at Gombe were doing great, but chimps overall were not. And even though that she had some fame at this point, could have just continued to do her life's work, her happy place, as we kind of referred to it at Gombe, she saw that there was a bigger problem. So she left her happy place, left the research that she loved and became an advocate worldwide, traveling 300 plus days a year to advocate for chimps, for habitats and for animals overall. And it ends with a call to action to everyone, and it challenges people to think about what they could do to make a difference. Join me in pledging to make a positive impact. Your pledge will become a leaf on the tree of hope, a symbol of the collective change we can create when we each do our part. Catherine and Alan, I'm wondering if you ever get a chance to walk around the exhibition as visitors are going through it and just seeing how they react to everything. Catherine, do you have any memories of when the doors first opened? Oh, I think I've been in that exhibition 200 times. I mean, it, it's my favorite thing to do <laughs> is to come in on the weekends and see families going through the show and watch them as they experience the story that we're trying to tell. I mean, it is really why we do what we do. I mean, I think all of us are in this business because we believe in this sort of transformative power of the in-person experience, right? You know, Alan's vision and his team does a really great job of kind of combining old design techniques and new design, right? And combining the power of an artifact with this incredible immersive 3D theater experience and having all of that with powerful photography, powerful audio, interactivity, all of that in one experience is just really, I think, becoming kind of a National Geographic hallmark, right, of an exhibit that we develop. And I don't think we could do it without partners like Falcons, because you all really have the expertise in sort of harnessing that new media and creating these immersive experiences that really tug at the heartstrings of our visitors. And I love watching it firsthand. There are a lot of different pieces of the exhibition that, that draw the visitor into Jane's story. I think um, it took Jane a while. I mean, I should say it took the chimpanzees a while to warm up to Jane. Even if you don't really follow Jane's story closely, you probably know of David Greybeard. And he was the first chimpanzee to accept Jane. And then it was a domino effect. Basically, all the chimpanzees began to, to grow to, to love Jane, not to get you know too soppy about it. But I think that's how the world sees it. And the immersive theater really underscores the impact that that had. And I think putting visitors in, in that place is one of probably the most powerful moments of the exhibition. I wanted to ask Jason what it took to create and design something like that. Well, luckily, we had some experience working in that particular immersive theater. The first time, we had LiDAR scans and 3D photogrammetry. The second time, we built it all from just really uh, loose reference and, and built it all in, in CGI. And now this third time, we leveraged more of a visual effects approach 
combining live action footage and CGI. We felt it was important to go out there and film it in VR using 3D VR cameras. And luckily we had the resources with Bill Wallauer and JGI to make that happen. And uh, I think it really paid off to have that immersive experience and really understand the landscape. So because we're dealing with live footage, the CGI had to really hold up and be photorealistic and play inside that world. So we really pushed the fidelity of uh, any of the virtual chimpanzees. You know, we did a full fur and muscle systems for all the chimps, so they really felt like they were real creatures. And honestly, looking at the experience once it's installed, it's really hard to even tell that they're CGI. I mean, to me, they just look real. It is a technological marvel yeah. from, from our standpoint. I mean, it just, it plays so wonderfully and, and the models and the live footage. And I think we'd be remiss without talking about Jane's role in here, which is just, I'm sure everyone was excited as, as I was to be able to spend the time and have the buy-in that she did to this at 85 years old, to be so interested in the technological aspect of this storytelling and be so interested in it. And this particular piece, the 3D theater, that all about the moment, the time when the chimpanzees accepted her. I mean, it's a really emotional story for Jane, even all these years later. And, you know, she agreed to sit down and record with us and really tell that story from a very first person, personal and emotional place, which is what the other side of this great success is, right? I mean, technologically, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It works. People are, are astounded and really feel like they're there. And then on top of it, they're hearing Jane right next to them, telling the story, seeing this through her eyes. 14th of July, 1960. The mountains rose up steeply behind the beaches. I shall remember this day all my life. It was the day I first set foot on the beach of what is today the Gombe National Park. Catherine, what do you think this experience means to visitors? Our goal from the beginning with this project was to allow people to meet Jane. She's such an iconic figure in the world. She is beloved. She's a childhood hero to generations now. And she's 86 years old. And not everyone that loves her will ever get to meet her or know her the way that we do. So I think our real goal um, was to sort of share her with the world and to do that by creating this experience where you we could tell her story allow you into that story and then ultimately allow you to meet Jane and be with her for the period of time that you're spending in this experience and have her change your life the way that she's changed ours and I think we were just utterly successful. I mean, there's so much of Jane's voice in this. There's so much of her spirit, of her hopes and dreams. It's like you're with her when you're there. And I think that all of the little girls and boys and their parents who come into the show sort of because they love Jane, they leave having been with her. I love that. Yeah, that's very well said. I wanted to ask Alan if he had anything to add to that. No, I think Catherine summed that up perfectly. I mean, oh, yeah. it, it's a very personal experience. And really, that was sort of what we wanted all along. And that is something that's been a National Geographic hallmark forever. She, in many ways, is the model of someone who is an explorer, a storyteller, but clearly an empath, right? Someone who feels their work. And I think Catherine summed it up. And, and I think, again, I would agree we were very successful in conveying who Jane is and that, from the title to the very last call to action in the show, was our goal to really always have this for her legacy. As we continue to study these amazing beings, we not only learn more about them, but about ourselves as well. Time is so precious to her now, you can imagine. And it's one of the greatest projects, honestly, one of my favorites. And I always say that my favorite is my next one, but this mm -hmm. one, it's sort of the culmination of so many projects that we've done. Um, and it's so good. Jason and Audrey and Cecil, I mean, we're so grateful that you all like embrace this project and we're really do like step it up and do stuff in warp speed like we always ask you to do. And um, mm -hmm. anyway, just it was a real labor of love from everybody, including Jane. And I'm just delighted with how it turned out. And I'm so excited to share it with museums for the next five years. A lot of people in the industry are excited about it, too. You know, in fact, it has won two very prestigious industry honors, the Thea Award for Outstanding Achievement in Museum Exhibit Design Limited Budget 
and the American Alliance of Museums Excellence in Exhibition Competition. So first of all, I wanted to get Catherine and Alan's take on what that means. And also, was this the first time, I believe, that National Geographic took home those awards, Alan? Yes, uh, it was the first time uh, winning either of those awards and an incredible honor. And as you said, it's it's gratifying personally to, to be accepted and, and celebrated by our peers and, and in the industry. But, you know, this is really about the show and about the visitor first and always is. So those two awards represent kind of the two halves of how we look at designing exhibitions here, which is really gratifying to, again, be honored by museums and also be honored by um, the attractions industry. All of our projects tend to be sort of this interesting hybrid that I don't see a whole lot of other people doing, but maybe is a trend in the future where we're taking the best of what museums have to offer and the best of what the attraction industry have to offer and using that to tell a really interesting, unique story that's smart and immersive and exciting and uh, inspiring all at the same time. And you all have been a big part, I think, of our success. I mean, we created that immersive theater, Jason, that you were talking about earlier um, a few years ago because we really wanted to deliver on what I consider to be sort of a, a principal brand promise for National Geographic. And Audrey, you touched on it earlier when you said that the theater really, tra- it literally transports you. And that's been the brand promise for National Geographic all along, right? I mean, you got the magazine in the mail when you were a kid and, uh, you know, all of a sudden you were transported to India or you were transported to Egypt or you were going, you know, you were able to go to a place that you didn't think you would ever see in your lifetime through the images and the pages of National Geographic. So, you know, to be able to apply that same brand promise to uh, an experience is what we were trying to accomplish with that theater. And it's just been just a tremendous amount of fun. That's exactly right, Catherine. And uh, Falcon's role in helping us kind of uh, create that very first immersive experience within the museum is really a big reason why we got the Jane Project as well. You know, the first project that we did together for National Geographic Headquarters was the Tomb of Christ. This, the, we had a LIDAR scan of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in, Jer- in Jerusalem. That piece came out so well and showed what we were capable of in this sort of immersive environment. And frankly, JGI and some of their influential board members saw that show and immediately said to themselves, oh my gosh, we need to bring people to Gombe in the same way that Falcons and, and National Geographic brought us to to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre within this exhibition. And that initial partnership between us is the reason why we were able to make this Jane exhibit. Who knows how we'll be telling stories in another 10, 15 years, but I, I guarantee you National Geographic will be at the forefront of using it because we know that our message is important, our explorers are important, their work is important, and always want to use uh, the most effective tool to be able to help them tell those stories. So we'd like to thank all three of you, Jason, Catherine, Allen. Thanks so much for being with us. We really appreciate your time. We know it's hectic right now. It's always good talking to you guys, hearing your voice. Thank you so much for having us. This was fun. Thank you. Thank you again and talk to you soon. Now we'll transition into our conversation with Bill Wallauer from the Jane Goodall Institute. Bill, thank you so much for joining us. Really my pleasure. Well, that was our human greeting, but since Bill is such an expert in this area, how would you greet me if I was a chimpanzee? So if I was a chimp in the forest and I wanted to know where Audrey was and was looking for Audrey, um, I would make a call that's called the pant hoot, and it sounds something like this. So that is hello in chimpanzees. And hello to you too. And I am not going to do that. But (laughs) we asked people to do that for Chimp Chat, which is one of the exhibits at the uh, Becoming Jane exhibition. And from what I hear, people had a really good time doing that. We were initially thinking, is this going to just be for kids? But uh, we heard adults really got into it as well. Well, it was fun in the first few days of you know, watching people experience the exhibit, they weren't shy at all. They went right up to that part of the chimp chat and gave it a shot. And it's interactive. And so the chimp actually grades you on on your ability to respond in chimp and doesn't let you go on until you have kind of made a a reasonably good chimp vocalization. And so it's, I think we've done five different vocalizations. And so Mm -hmm. people can brush up on their chimp chat as they go through the museum. 
That's great. I mean, one of the things we also remember when we were on set with you and Jane um, shooting for this exhibition was you greeted each other, I believe, with the pant hood, right? Yeah. Um, often we do that in all because, you know, she is alpha for sure, alpha female. I, I went up and pant grunted to her and gave her an open mouth kiss, which is. <laughs> um, and then right. I, I would like just open my mouth and press my teeth to her shoulder or something. And that's what that's a chimp greeting. And that's just how we've greeted each other since 1992. Oh, wow. I could picture you and Jane working together all those years in the jungle. And um, I mean, it just gives me chills. Um, you guys do such great work. And I wanted to ask you personally, do you have any favorite memories of working with Jane? Oh, so many. <laughs> One of the cool things is my entire life in Gombe has been documented on my own, as you would, home movies. <laughs> you know, Jane and my first walk in the forest I have on video. <laughs> That's awesome. And so we have this amazing and treasured archive of 15 years of the lives of the Gombe chimps. And, you know, I was able to record a live birth. Oh. And that was Gaia on Valentine's Day in 1993. Oh. Gaia is still around with her mother, Gremlin, um, who is now 50 years old. And so I followed Gaia's entire life from before she was even born. Um, you know, if it hadn't been chimps, it would have been something else. Jane would have been out there doing something amazing. Because when you follow her in the forest, she has that same curiosity of if she can't find chimps or whatever we're doing, you know, she's looking around for the little bugs that are crawling across her and looking up in the trees at the amazing bird species and other primates and other small mammals in the forest. And so that forest is so precious and such a treasure. It really is one of those jobs or careers that there's never a dull moment. Oh, that's great. That footage you were able to shoot there on site in Tanzania was invaluable. Can you tell us about that experience and especially using new technology? I think we sent you off with a new camera and a new motion stabilizer. What was that like? So that was incredible because the challenge of working with a 360 camera is that it has to stay relatively flat and steady. And Gombe is not either relatively flat and when you walk, you're not steady. And so trying to shoot useful shots in places that weren't thickets and weren't so challenging to get through, it wasn't going to give you an idea of what it was like to be in Gombe. And so that's what I wanted to try to give the visitors is that window of what it was like for Jane to walk through that forest for the first time, because the forest hasn't actually changed that much in the 60 years. And so what you're experiencing in that 360 tour is something very similar to what Jane first experienced when she got there. And that was the goal. But um, it, it was a lot of fun to do that. And the new technology and the, the little steady cam thing, I, I, I must have looked ridiculous as I was walking through the forest trying to hide myself. I think I held it over my head so I would kind of disappear because it's hard enough to walk in Gombe just with my camera or something. So this just added elements of challenge. The visitor is really going to get a feel of what it was like and what it's like now to be Jane in Gombe. One thing I wanted to bring up with you too is uh, a lot of the messaging in this exhibition aligns with the Jane Goodall Institute's messaging. Can you talk a little bit about some of that crossover? Well, I, I think the important take-home message from this is that one, Jane is this iconic person who says every individual makes a difference every day and every person matters. And so that, that kind of gives us a responsibility, if you will, towards each other and the planet. And, and that's kind of Jane's mantra. And she likes to find examples of what one person has done to change the planet for the better, to make the world a better place for people, animals, environment. She epitomizes that philosophy. The most important thing I can say to you is that you as an individual matter. If we want to turn things around, we will have to stop depending on someone else to save the world. And so to aspire as you go through this amazing museum and you know you experience Jane's life, you see this person almost reluctantly leaving the forest and coming out with this message of hope and inspiration. And I think the, the museum really captured that well. My greatest reason for hope is the indomitable human spirit. The people who tackle what seems impossible and succeed inspire those around them. You can see as you go through this museum exhibit, you know, the, what the threats are to chimps in these forests and then what we're doing about it. 
and Jane's Take Care program of not just saying, oh, things are messed up and we're here to help and we're here to save the day, but it's much more about working with communities together in partnership and empowering them to make their own decisions. And it was interesting what you were saying a second ago, it's what I had said, that Gombe hadn't changed much in the last 60 years internally. But on the outside, which had slowly been whittled away, those programs that I'm talking about have actually worked extraordinarily well to bring back woodland and forest that had been chopped down over the last 60 years. These forests and woodlands that had been cut down are returning. And so a grassy hillside that had been clear cut and burned in the 80s, I can walk through now and I'll be surrounded by 30 foot trees. And, oh, that's and so that's a real victory, and it shows that community-based management has really, really succeeded. But I still have hope, because nature is amazingly resilient. I've seen places we destroyed once again support plant and animal life when they're given time and perhaps some help. When we were on set with her, I mean, when, when she was reading the lines for her call to action piece of the exhibition, she was so powerful that it was hard not to get swept up in, in her own positivity. And I still get swept up after 31 years. I still get that same feeling that you got last year when you first met Jane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that almost butterflies in your stomach. Like You really feel like you're around greatness. And she does not think of herself that way. And she did not. This was not her childhood dream, what she's doing now. I, I think she does it out of responsibility. But her heart is still in the forest but how lucky we are to have her in our lives and to have someone who's so positive and so hopeful in a time mm -hmm. that, you know, you could easily get negative and feel doomed. And yet there's not an ounce of that in her. Well, lucky you. I mean, we've all been lucky to work on this project. And um, like I said, you you were a big part of it. You are our scientific advisor, my, my personal go-to anytime I had questions. Um, just a great resource. And, and we wanted to take this opportunity to thank you again for your part. Well, I, I think it's a fantastic opportunity for people to reconnect with Jane and what Jane's done and, and what her vision is, especially now. I think we are dealing with very tough times and I think people see a light at the end of the tunnel. And so if this exhibit can start traveling and re-inspiring and reconnecting and encouraging people, you know, hopefully this will be one of those stories that people can really rally around and say, yeah, I want to be a little bit more like Jane. And I was I was just emailing somebody who said, you know, aren't our lives better for aspiring to be a little bit more like Jane? Well said. Well, thank you so much, Bill, for joining us. And hopefully we'll be talking soon. Yeah, no, this was great. Thanks for having me. I encourage you to pledge to make a positive impact, then use your voice on social media to amplify your impact and encourage others to join in doing their part. Together, we can and will change the world. If you're wondering if Jane had an opportunity to see the exhibition for herself, the answer is yes. She saw it in California when it traveled to the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. We're all really glad she did. If you'd like to learn more about what Jane Goodall is up to these days, visit janegoodall.org. I want to once again thank our guests for this episode, Catherine Keene and Alan Parente, Bill Wallauer, and our own Jason Ambler. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back soon with another episode. Thank you for listening to Experience Imagination, a Falcons Creative Group production. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and share with your friends. To keep up with our latest news, visit us on the web at falconscreativegroup.com and follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes, please email us at podcast at falconscreativegroup.com.